back with you again. We're going to continue our uh, journey through John. One encouragement is in the bulletin there are, there's an insert uh, as, for it with an outline. Uh, that's for your benefit. Uh, note-taking is actually a very good spiritual discipline. Uh, it's not because I think my words are so amazing or so special, uh, but because God's word is so amazing and so special. And it really can be very transformative in your life. The problem is 80% of we, what we hear, we forget by the time you leave church. Uh, so it's a great way to, to uh, help you remember what was said. So you're not just receiving data and information, but words that can be transformative in your life as you apply them. And th- th- there could be a grateful tool for family devotions or talking on the way home or a small group study. And it's, and it's free. And if you, do, if you take notes through the whole series, put them in a notebook, you have a free uh, expository commentary in the Gospel of John. And I'll sign those at the end, and they're worth a lot of money then. No. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Last week we looked at what is meant by Jesus being referred to as the logos. Logos means the rational for life, the reason for life, purpose. We are created by God and for God. The classical statement for that is in a confession. What is the chief end of man? And the answer to that is the chief end of man is to... Yeah, uh, serve God and enjoy him uh, forever. So we have, with Christ, we have uh, purpose to live for, and we also have truth uh, to live on. Today we're going to get a sneak peek of the God behind the curtain. It's like the Wizard of Oz, the guy, who, the, real, the real person. What God looked like when no one else was around. We're looking at the pre-existence of God. In the beginning it says the, it was the Word. Uh, we get to see what God was like when no one was around. And we like this kind of stuff. Um, people like to see what the person is really like behind the scenes, not what they see um, publicly. That's why li- Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous was a popular TV show or TMZ or uh, Inside Edition. Uh, that's why uh, tell-all books are so popular. People uh, have these people they look up to, but, they, but they're so, because they're so successful and so famous, they're so, so unrelatable, but if you get to know them as a person behind the scenes, just, it just kind of humanizes them. And it also helps you gauge whether or not this is someone you, you should really look up to or not. Is this really someone who should shape your life or affect your life? And sometimes you hear stories of people you admire on TV uh, or on the stage, and they disappoint you in their real life. You go, oh, man. Or you find that they're just people of substance and character, and it really encourages you. John does that for us. John gives us a tell-all book, a behind-the-scenes look of God. He gives us what I call the view from above. If you ever look at a mountain, you can, there's the view from the foothills, and that's a good view, but the view from the mountaintop is so much better. You see all the connecting parts. It gives you a greater understanding, a greater view. And that's what John does. And he gives us a peek at the relationship between God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, this is important because it's in this God's image we were created. And if we grasp who he is and grasp how he created, uh, it will revolutionize your faith and heal you in many ways uh, you can't possibly imagine. Also, can heal a lot of our social ills. Here's what he says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Heavenly Father, we lift those words up to you and pray, Lord, that you will unpack them for us so we can understand their dynamism and how they and the implications for life, and how they really can transform it, revolutionize our faith, our life, and heal us in many ways. We pray that you'll do do that tonight, uh, tonight, this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people prayed. All right. First thing we see in John's peak of God's before life, before anyone was around, was that God lived in an intimate community. God lived in intimate community, and the word was with God. God. In verse 18, Jesus said, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God, now imagine that, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Now the word with is a really powerful word. It literally means 
in the bosom of the Father, it gives you kind of a picturesque image of the intimate relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, um, a question for you, kind of unpack this. Who has a right to your bosom? Think on that. I mean, some of you might say nobody, you know. But I think new, newborn children have a right to your bosom, right? When they're small and they're little, if you're a mother, you're a nurse. If, if you're a father, you kind of hold them closely. That's kind of the intimate connection. Now, as they get older, they, they kind of push apart, right? There's a little bit of separation. And that's good because over time you will play a less central role in their life. It's just called growing up, uh, nurturing. If there's a problem if they're 10 years old and they're still breastfeeding you. That's a problem, right? You know? Uh, with fathers, I think daughters kind of have a right to their chest. My daughters, even they're in their 20s, will, when they visit, will sometimes lean up against me. Um, I think that's kind of special. Um, spouses typically have a right to a person's bosom. Now, for me, a person who doesn't have a right to my bosom are my best friends. My best friends do not have a right to my bosom. So if you're watching the football game, don't lean up against me, dude. All right? I'm just saying. <laughs> But in the bosom kind of communicates this kind of <laughs> intimacy, uh, this primacy, this centrality in a person's life. Now, realize when, when this was written, it says in the beginning, uh, in the, God has no body yet. Uh, he's not incarnate in Jesus. He didn't take on human flesh yet. So what does it mean then? It means that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are wrapped into each other's soul. They share a soulish connection that is deeper, it's in a deep and abiding love relationship, which is kind of hard to relate to, but I think there are some things that will help us grasp it. I know there are people who are soulmates. I've seen this, and it's kind of a, an awesome thing. People who are just from the very get-go connected deeply, and when that person that loses their spouse, it just, just, just destroys them. My grandfather, my grandmother was one of those. Um, six months after she passed away, this patriarch, this man who's, I'd never seen him ill, died, just, just died. And it's because his heart was absolutely broken. They had shared 50, over 50 years of this soulish relationship. Now take that and multiply it by a billion, and that gives you a sense for the type of relationship uh, God has with his son. They shared this soul relationship for billions of years. We don't know really how long. I mean, even in the best of marriages, the tightest of marriages, we only know a fraction of our marriage. We, do, we know a, barely a fraction of ourselves, and people will still say, you know, I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I think that. I don't know why I reacted that way. So we know only a fraction of ourselves. We know even less about our spouses. And yet the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit know each other completely without reservation. We see in a glass darkly. They see face to face. They have an exhaustive relationship with one another. Now, think in your life the time when you were the most in love. Capture that moment and then multiply it by a million and get a sense for this intimate relationship that the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit share. Uh, Jonathan Edwards says this, No child was as ever at one with his mother. No husband was as ever at one with his wife. No soul has been as one with her own body as the Son was one with the Father. Jesus said, the Father and I are one. John 17, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now picture it. Picture God living in community, this intimate, soulless relationship for millions and millions, maybe billions and billions of years. Just, just the love, joy, grace just flowing, pouring into each other life flowing out from each other, an, an incredible relationship. I thought, you know, as a, as a kid, that Christianity is boring, you know? But this doesn't sound very boring to me. It sounds pretty, pretty powerful. Think in your early dating relationship, if you dated, uh, how important was the place to you? Well, place was of utmost importance because you wanted to impress, you wanted a second date, or maybe a third date, uh, or maybe a fourth date. But over time, place loses its power. It's not really important. You can just hang out together and do nothing, and it's a joyous, loving, intimate, life-giving experience. It's not boring at all. Again, take that and multiply it, 
And that's the kind of intimate relationship that the father and the son share. Not only did they live in an intimate community, but they also uh, lived in a community that was incredibly creative. It says, through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. And I think this, these words actually parallel well with uh, Proverbs. Proverbs 8 uh, des- describes wisdom and where wisdom was at in creation. It almost sounds like Jesus, does it? And let me read it to you. Listen. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizons on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed the, securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in the whole world and delighting in mankind. Now imagine that. Get picture um, God living in this joyous, loving, delightful community, and it's just flowing back and forth, this kind of, this ring of love, this ring of fire. Uh, and then this joy, this love comes bursting into creation. Uh, God could no longer contain his love. They could no longer contain his joy. It has to be shared. And first, God creates the world, and, and the, but the love keeps flowing, and it's not enough. And he, 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 he wants to create a being who can share in this ring of love and to share in this ring of joy. I think Johnny Cash captures the, cust- the, the combustibility of love and how it can be consuming in the ring of fire. Love is a burning thing. You can even sing with me. And it makes a fiery ring. Bound by wild desire, I fell into the ring of fire. I fell into the burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burns, burns, burns the ring of fire, this ring of fire. The taste of love is sweet when hearts like ours meet. I fell for you like a child, but oh, the fire went wild. And that's really a great description of what happened in creation. This love becomes combustible. This joy has to be shared. And that's true of all of us. Joy has to be shared. You see a great movie. What do you want to do? You share with other people. Yeah. You have a great meal at a restaurant. What do you do? You share it. Yeah. I can't tell you how many said, you got to try Thai orchid. You got to try Thai orchid. <laughs> or you hear a song. Hey, what do you do? You tell people, hey, you got to hear this, right? My daughter's always sending me songs all the time, almost every week, because she hears a song, and she, she just loves it, and she wants to share it. Joy has to be shared. Uh, the same thing is true about love. Love has to be shared. Love um, has to be given away. I think it's interesting that how God created marriage and the birth of children, how that all works out, in that it seems to mirror what happened in creation, doesn't it? What, what, is, what did God do? God, God puts us into, the, the, we, we fall in love, right? And, and in love, in this intimate relationship, um, birth, birth children, children just the result of this kind of ring of love that we share. We don't have children because we just want to keep our namesake or to replace ourselves. It's a result of the love that we have, and it's, and it's just combusts in creation, combusts in birth. And love is a multiplier. Uh, think about this. Uh, when you had your first child, if you had a child, um, you loved your child 100%, right? Now, if you had two children, does that mean you love the other one less than the first? I'm sorry, I can only love you 50% because I have to share, I need to reserve 50% for this child. Then you have, like I did, four children. Now I only got 25, 25, 25. I only got 100%, right? So I can only give 25, 25, 25, 25. Is that true? No, you love each of them 100%, right? Why? How's that happen? Because love is a multiplier. Love has to be shared. Now, what are the implications of this? What are the implications that were created in this kind of image of this God who creates in this way? It has a lot of implications. One is, it tells us that the foundation of the universe is love. The essence of reality is relationship. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Interstellar? Interstellar is a powerful movie, but it has a, a powerful line. 
What's the one constant, they said, that exists that transcends both time, matter, and space? Does anyone have the answer? This is for Jeopardy. <laughs> love. Yeah, love transcended all of those things. And that's what, what, that's what God is saying. Love, relationships, transcends all things. Now, what does this do? How, what, what's the implications? One, I think it offers us a better vision for life. At least it's a better vision than one I see offered by the world. There are two modern options present to the Christian view. The one is, I referred to it last week, the scientific view. And that is, everything is made up of matter and molecules. Bertrand Russell said, man is the product of the accidental collocations of atoms and all human genius will one day die in the vast depth of the solar system. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, he's just the life of the party, can the soul salvation hence be safely built. Now, from that perspective, what is love? Love is nothing more than the fact that synapses used to run down your left side of the brain. Now it simply goes down the right side of your brain. Love is simply a chemical... <coughs> A chemical response in the brain. Now, those who believe this still don't talk like this. I mean, a scientist's husband or a person who has this view doesn't say to his wife, you know what, love really is an illusion. All that really is happening between us is I used to have synapses going this way, and now I have synapses that go that way. Imagine his wife saying, oh, honey, you're such a good talker. You're, well, that's so beautiful. Uh, we, though people may believe this way, they can't live this way. Uh, in the other view, the New Ageistic view, truth, there is truth, and truth is we are all God. Uh, you look for truth within. You realize your, own, you realize your own divinity, power, and greatness. The purpose of life is to re-own the God-likeness within you. Perfect love helps us back to the foundation of life, which is consciousness. This is, just comes from the writing. What is love in this view, worldview? Love is Something you use. There's utility to it. Uh, you love people that, that benefit you. The reason for love is for you're using them for your personal benefit. That's not Christian love. Christian love, as defined by the cross, is sacrificial service for the good of others without any thought of benefit to oneself. Uh, now, though these views sound different, they share another common belief, and that is the belief that the world in which we live is impersonal. God is not a he or a person, but an impersonal force. And it's interesting. If you, if you uh, watch the Star Wars trilogy, uh, well, not trilogy, it's like, there's nine of them now, um, you realize, though, people who believe this can't live it consistently. Now, what do I mean? What I mean is how, when Luke and them reappear, or Obi-Wan or Darth Vader, when they reappear in the afterlife, what do they appear as? They appear as luminous beings. You, you, can, you see their body. You, you, that's, that's who he is. Or Yoda has a voice. Uh, but that's not the Eastern view. That's not the Eastern view. That's the Christian view. Eastern view is you're, at the end of life, you're just force. You're an impersonal force. There's no I. There's no person. There's no personality. Again, that's the Christian view of the afterlife. And I find it interesting, those who hold to this view will always adopt the Christian view of the afterlife. Why? Because to think anything else is unbearable. If the Eastern view is right, there is no reunion. There is no seeing your loved ones at the end of life. All that happens you is you are, you are reabsorbed into the universe. You are, as one author said it, a dew drop in the vast ocean of life. You're just an electron particle. There is no consciousness. It's all stripped away. You become part of nature. You have no name, no awareness, no self. It's an impersonal universe. The Christian view, which is I find interesting, people who, who do not share the Christian faith will still adopt the Christian view of the afterlife. It says this. It says, you are neither the collocation of molecules or a dew drop in the vast ocean of life. The foundation of reality is relationship. It is loving, joyous, life-giving, personal relationships. God is not identical to creation. He's distinct, distinct from it. And out of love, he created. Which means when you die, you don't simply become dirt or energy, but you walk right into the arms of a loving father. That's the Christian view. And it's because this world isn't impersonal. It's not because we are not an accident, but we are created out of the overflow of this intimate relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
and why everyone takes comfort in the Christian view of the afterlife, even though they don't believe in the Christian view of life, is because, again, to think anything else unbearable. We, we desire reunion. Our heart's desire is reunion. And the good news is this. In Jesus Christ, you get your heart's desire. You get what you hope for because it is true. But I encourage you, if you don't haven't accepted Christ, believe the good news and bring harmony to your mind and to your heart's desire. And when you do, you will realize you are, instead of becoming Adams or dewdrops, you become sons and daughters of God, joint heirs in Jesus, and you share this ring of love, joy, and grace that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share. So not only does the Christian view of creation and the Christian view of God create a better vision for this life, it also presents a better hope for the future. And it does something else. It also, um, in Scripture it says, it is not good for, let's see what time we got. I'm good. It is not good for a man to be alone. It's not good for a man to be alone. Think about where was Adam when God said this? In the Garden of Eden, he is smack dab in the middle of paradise. And paradise is not enough. Creation is not enough to satisfy him. Nature is not enough. I thought my dream of uh, retirement is log cabin living. But as I look at scripture, my log cabin living is not going to satisfy me. Uh, Why is it? Because we need relationships. We need community. We need a circle of friends. Because that's how we're created. That's the foundation of reality, the foundation of life. Um, how many of you have a bucket list? How many have bucket lists? How many of you want to do your bucket list alone? Nobody does. Even if you're single, single people will still, if they go to a great trip, always want to have a, invite a friend over. My daughters came to me. The reason why I started dating again, dating again, because I was pretty jaded against the uh, female gender, if you uh, uh, know my story. I really didn't want anything to do with them, except for my daughters. They were all right, all right? But I said, Dad, Dad, you know what? You have a bucket list. We know you have a bucket list. Can you really see yourself doing it alone? And I, and I couldn't. So I started a date again. Because we have this hunger we want to be with others because we are created in the image of a with it God. And only our relationships will satisfy. One day this world will cease to exist. Heaven and earth will disappear. One thing will remain. What is it? Relationships. People. God and us. Think about it. God existed for millions and billions of years before anything was created, before stuff even existed. Think about that. Which means, again, the foundation of life is relationship. That's why stuff will never make you happy. Stuff will never satisfy you. Because that's not what life is about. Uh, We are created to know God and to be in relationship with God and with one another. We We are born, we are created... In the image of a relational God, and only relations that will satisfy him. So, the Trinity also reveals the source of our happiness. Now, a cautionary note, though. It has to be in this order. You need a relationship with God who invites you into this intense circle of love, joy, and grace. This ring of fire. And once he fills you, it then overflows into your other relationships and they become life-giving. You become a life-giving person. If you do it the other way around, if you look to people for happiness, what's going to happen? Yeah, they're going to disappoint you. They're going to leave you. It's it's not going to work. How many of you know needy people? People who need their sons or daughters or need a spouse, need a boyfriend, need a girlfriend. What, what do they do? They zap you of energy. They exhaust you. Because what you're, they're asking you to do is become their functional savior. And we do not make good functional saviors. If you want a life-giving love in relationships, you first have to be filled with God's love who then flows out of you and just pours into overflow and it becomes life-giving. If you do the other way around, you simply will exhaust people and you will have the relationships. Well, people will just 
run away from you because you're exhausting them. You're zapping their energy. Also, I think the, this view of creation and God gives us a picture of the type of community we are called to be. This is what the church is called to be. This is how our relationships are to be characterized. It's supposed to be overflowing with love and joy and grace. And is that your experience with the church? Is that your experience? I've been in a lot of churches. And, uh, it, and, and I've seen a lot of things flow, but it wasn't love, joy, and peace. You know what I'm saying? I saw a lot of stuff that flow, and it doesn't belong. But that's the, it gives us a great vision for the type of churches we, we need to be, we ought to be, the world needs us to be, and the type of small groups that we are to create. Because you can't love in a group. You can only love in a small group. You and I need a small circle of friends who can pour life into us, and we can pour life into them, that we can share this, this circle of love, joy, and faith, and grace with each other. And that's a great vision. Also, I think this gives us a profound, and this is where I'm ending, a pr- profound uh, understanding of the transformative power of the gospel. Now think about this. Uh, think about death. Think of the pain of the loss of a loved one. Some of you have experiences. Most of us here probably have experienced the loss of a loved one. Now imagine the pain of losing someone you've loved for 50, 60, 70 years. Imagine they were your soulmate and the depth of the pain. Now hold on to that, capture that. Add to it, what, was it, what is it like, how painful it is to lose a child? It's one thing to lose a parent. Parents expect to, to be buried. They don't expect to bury their children. How many of you know my mom lost a child? How many of you know the pain of the loss of a child? It's incredible. I think there may be one thing more painful, not the death of a child, but painful than death of a spouse is divorce. Now, I'll, I'll say why. Because in death, your loved ones leave you, but they don't want to. And there is hope for the future because there is a reunion. You will see each other, and you'll want to embrace and see the other person. And divorce is different. They leave you because they want to. And on top of the loss and grief of the relationship, you also experience incredible rejection. Now, now capture that, what that feeling is like. And there's no, there's no future There's no reunion because they don't want to see you. They don't want to be around you. So there's no hope for the future. Capture that. God experienced all three of those things. It says before the foundation of the world, it means as he created, he knew he would lose his soulmate to death. He knew he would lose his child and be, be murdered by people he loved. And he would see that. He knew he would have to reject his child and all the pain that goes with it. And he did it because he loved you more. Think on that. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we held him in lowest esteem. Surely he took our pain and he bore our suffering. Can you grasp The incredible love of God. It said Jesus rejoiced in his whole world as he was creating and delighted in mankind. He loved us more in order to invite us into this fellowship of love, grace, and joy. So that one day you will not become dirt or energy, but sons and daughters of God. Can you feel that? Can you grasp the gospel? If you do, pull it into your heart. Anchor it into your soul. If you do, four things will happen. God will heal you in four ways. One, it will heal your heart from the pain of rejection. And have you been rejected? Have you experienced the pain of rejection? Someone greater than the person who rejected you has accepted you. It will heal a soul wounded by withheld love, disapproval, or the lack of approval. And do you feel or have you felt that pain? It can heal you of that. Because it says God loves you, God approves for you, You're, he doesn't disapprove of you, he is for you, not against you. It will heal you of a fragile ego, 
What is a fragile ego? A fragile ego is just an unloved self, which makes you susceptible to all kinds of things. Overreacting, attacking, being overly sensitive to criticism, uh, being easily hurt by the words of others, hurting others, a feeling of superiority where you kind of bolster your ego, or a deflated ego, which is inferiority. All are alienating, all are self-sabotaging. And God can heal you if you just pull the gospel into your heart and, and receive what he says about you. And it will create a reservoir of love that will spill out into the lives of others in life-giving ways. So I encourage you, I implore you to receive Christ into your life and let him pull you into his ring of fire and it will heal you in wonderful ways. Let's pray.